Buddha often compared himself to a doctor, and the Dharma was his medicine. When we think about this image, it's important to remind ourselves that the Buddha was not a doctor in an HMO. You didn't go to him and get a shot. Traditional medicine is a lot more strategic than modern medicine is. The canon gives us a picture of Jiwaka, the Buddha's own personal physician, and the stories of how he became an expert doctor. And it's not only a matter of learning what plants were medicinal. But a lot of his expertise lay in his strategies, how to deal with difficult patients, how to deal with difficult diseases. And so when the Buddha was saying he was a doctor, he was very strategic. He often said that when he spoke, it was not just a question of saying what's true. That was just the first question he would ask before you made up your mind to say something. He also said that what he spoke was beneficial and that it was timely. In other words, his words were designed to have a specific effect, and he would take into consideration the circumstances to see if this was the right time and the right place to say those words so he could get the desired effect. This is why when Ananda Pindaka, who was a stream editor and would seem to be qualified to know, when he was asked, what kind of views does the Buddha have? He said, I really don't know entirely what views the Buddha has. Because he realized that when the Buddha taught, he taught strategically. So when you read that the Buddha saw the world in this way, or he thought this or thought that, you have to ask yourself, well, to whom was he saying that, and in what situation, what conditions? Because as a doctor he had to be strategic. If you've ever had traditional medicinal treatments, you know that the treatments are a lot more varied and strategic than most modern medicine. I've known a couple of cases where a traditional doctor would treat one disease by actually inducing another disease. And once the first disease had been turned into the second disease, then he could knock off the second disease. What this meant was that sometimes you would take a particular medicine. And then at a certain point in the treatment, you'd have to drop the medicine, take up something else. Some medicines you would take all the way through the treatment, but these other ones, once if it was one that had to be changed, you could not touch the first medicine. Or in the course of taking the first medicine, you couldn't touch the second one. So when you look at the Buddha's teachings, you have to ask yourself, which are the teachings that apply across the board? Which are the ones that are designed for a particular stage in the practice? For example, the Buddha makes heavy use of perceptions. He says we suffer because of misperceptions of things. Seeing constancy and what's inconstant. Pleasure and what's painful, self and what's not self, and attractiveness and what's really unattractive. But he doesn't then just go say, well, just turn your perceptions around, and that's the solution to the problem. The solution is more indirect. Before you take up the three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and non-self, he has you develop other perceptions first. 
in particular the perceptions that lead the mind to concentration while you're here. Focus on your breath. What keeps you with the breath? It's a perception. There's a mental label that says breath. And a lot of the concentration practice is learning how to gain a perception of breath that you can hold in mind for long periods of time with a sense of ease, with a sense of well-being. And you can test different perceptions of the breath to see which ones hold. In other words, which ones you can stick with. This would seem to go against the perception of inconstancy, and it does. You're actually looking for a perception you can hold on to as constant. You want to see the breath as something consistent that you can stay with. For example, if you see the in-breath and the out-breath as two radically different things, it's going to be hard to stay, because you have to keep switching back and forth between the two perceptions. But if you see the breath energy as something that's there in the body all the time, try to hold that perception in mind, you'll see that you perceive the breathing process in a different way. The breath is always there. The question is whether you're pumping it in to fall or letting it squeeze out too much. When you see breath energy in that way, it's a lot easier to adjust the breath in a way that feels right, feels healthy, feels nourishing. And you can gain a sense of fullness without feeling stuffed. And when you breathe out, you know the spot where you, you can begin to sense the spot where you've breathed out too much. You're squeezing the breath energy depleting yourself of breath energy in ways you don't need to. And in this stage in the game, you simply want to hold on to that perception. You would use the three perceptions only when you find the mind pulled away from the breath to other things. You look at the happiness, the pleasure that comes from chasing after other things, and you want to see it as less constant than the pleasure that comes from staying with the breath. More stressful, less under your control. So at this stage in the game, you're, or this stage in treating your illness, you're actually focusing on constancy. Seeing the breath is always there. And John Lee talks about this. He says, you want to see what's constant and what's inconstant. If you see everything as inconstant, he says, you're missing some important aspects, some important parts of the training. The example he gives is symbolic. He says, your lower lip has never turned into your upper lip. That's something constant about your lower lip. Your eye has never turned into an ear. In other words, there are some aspects of the breath energy in the body that really are constant. As long as you're alive, there will be breath energy in the body. And you can learn to use that fact to your advantage. Just stick with that perception of breath and see how the, the constant breath energy in the body goes through fluctuations, but you can hold on to the idea that there is breath constantly there, simply that it's Sometimes stuffed in too full, sometimes it's squeezed out until it's too depleted. But you can learn to adjust it, the rate of your in-breath and out-breath. See the in-breath, the in-ness and the out-ness as secondary, and the existence of breath meditation in the body as you're given, that you hold on to. That's how you use perception at this stage in the game. When your concentration is solid enough, then you can start using the three perceptions to start taking things apart. But until you've reached that stage, you don't want to think in those terms. If you start out with the three perceptions and try to use them as your medicine all along the way, it's very hard to get the mind into concentration. So 
to realize that there are stages in this treatment. Your mind is sick. What's the illness? Greed, anger, and delusion. And this is the treatment. It has its different stages. You can try to get as constant and easeful and controlled a state of mind as you can. You're actually fighting against those three perceptions. But it's only when you fight against the truth do you know how true it is, where its limitations are. So remind yourself that you're engaged in a strategy here. And don't try to jump the gun. So well, I'd like to go straight to the three perceptions, get everything done with so I can go on with my life. The practice has its rhythms, just as the treatment of a disease has its rhythms. Sometimes you might want to ask the doctor ahead of time, how many months do I have to stay in this stage of the treatment before I switch it around? He says, well, it really depends on how long it takes the body to respond. And it's the same with concentration practice. How many years does it take? John Fuin would often say, don't ask. Just do what needs to be done. And when the mind gets ripe, whether it's fast or slow, that the important thing is that it's ripe. Ripe for insight, ripe for other stages of using perception. So in the meantime, don't try to second-guess the Buddha. If this is your stage of treatment, stick with it. Because the Buddha was an expert doctor. And there are a lot of paradoxes in his strategies. But the strategies have worked for more than 2,500 years. Because they deal with elements that are constant in all people's minds, regardless of where you come from, what age you live in. That's why the Buddha said the Dharma is timeless. It's not something that was true only in the time of the Buddha. It's true across the board. The timed aspect of it simply is which stage are you in the treatment of your disease? try to apply the Buddhist teachings in a timely way. And you finally get to the ultimate timelessness that the whole training is aimed at, total freedom from disease. <laughs>